Good evening from the Westfield Studio Theater in the Idea Center at Playhouse Square here in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Nick Castell, senior reporter at IdeaStream Public Media and host of the After Jackson podcast, covering the race to become Cleveland's next mayor. Three weeks from now, Cleveland voters will do something they have not done in 16 years, elect a new leader for their city, a leader who will have profound influence over not only the residents of Cleveland proper, but families and businesses throughout the region. Welcome to Cleveland Mayoral Debate Voters First, a presentation of IdeaStream Public Media and the City Club of Cleveland, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization and one of the oldest free speech forums in the United States. Our partners for this debate include C Crane's Cleveland Business and the Cleveland Documenters. We welcome those watching on WVIZ, listening on WCPN, and streaming the event. Questions will come from me and from two panelists here at the Westfield studio. I am pleased to introduce Elizabeth McIntyre, executive editor of Crane's Cleveland Business, and Lawrence Daniel Caswell, field coordinator for Cleveland Documenters. The rules for tonight's debate have been agreed to by both campaigns. Candidates will have 60 seconds to answer each question, and I will manage rebuttals as needed. Both candidates may not necessarily answer every question asked. Each candidate will make an opening and closing statement. And now, the two candidates running in the general election to become mayor of Cleveland, Kevin Kelly, council president from Ward 13, and nonprofit executive Justin Bibb, welcome to you both, and thank you for agreeing to participate in this debate. Let's begin with your opening remarks. A random drawing before the debate determined the order, and council president Kelly, you'll speak first. Uh, thank you, Nick, and I want to thank IdeaStream and City Club for hosting, and I want to thank everybody who's watching tonight. As most of you know by now, my name is Kevin Kelly, and my most important attributes are that I'm a father and I'm a husband. My wife Elizabeth and I, together, we're raising five strong, independent young women. And I've been working in Cleveland neighborhoods every day of my adult life. I've been an advocate, I've been a social worker, I've been a councilman, and for the past eight years, I've been president of Cleveland City Council. And now I'm running for mayor, the hardest job in government. But I'm no stranger to hard work. I have been working since I've been 11 years old, and I know that Clevelanders are struggling right now. And I want you to know that I've struggled too, I've known struggle. When I was younger, I lost my father, we lost our family home. We've been on public assistance. But I also know that there's challenges and struggles that I'll never know. But I know that as Clevelanders, we don't give up. We fight through. And as your mayor, I will fight for you every day, with you and for you. We will make sure that we put Clevelanders back to work. We'll make sure that our citizens have broadband access. We will make sure that we have true neighborhood equity. But none of this will matter if we, as a community, do not accept and as our top priority the surge of gun violence. If we do not get our arms around the safety issue, nothing else that we do will matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Mr. Bibb, your opening remarks. Good evening. My name is Justin Bibb, and I'm running for mayor because I believe that now is the time for a bold, new, dynamic, visionary leadership to move our city forward. This election is about putting people and neighborhoods first. This election is about opportunity and change so that our city can live up to its fullest potential. And in this election, we can elect a leader who not only understands these issues on a personal basis as a working class kid from the southeast side, but a leader who is committed to bringing innovative and new ideas to solve many of our age old problems. I've spent my entire career working to bring people together. I've worked with big city mayors all across the country as an executive at Gallup. I fought for more affordable public transit as a leader at RTA. And I am committed now more than ever to doing the hard work of reimagining what policing should look like, to do the hard work of having a more modern and responsive city hall, and doing the hard work to ensure that every child inside our public schools has the skills they need to live up to their God-given potential. Now is the time for urgent leadership to move our city forward, and I'm ready for the job. Thank you. Thank you both, gentlemen. As we begin the questioning for this evening, let me set the stage. We have a series of key topics we'll explore with questions presented by me, Elizabeth, and Lawrence. We'll introduce each topic segment by hearing from someone in the city who's been affected in some way by that topic. Our first topic tonight, crime and safety. 
Bernadette Rowland's son, Dan, was shot and killed by a Cleveland police officer in 2011. Ten years later, she still says that justice was not served. When IdeaStream Public Media senior host Rick Jackson spoke with her recently, she talked about the need for police accountability. The main thing in my situation was the police were investigating the police. So if there's an excessive force case, if there's some sort of, you know, something that needs to be investigated by the, because the police did something wrong, broke the law, whatever they did, someone else definitely needs to um, be in charge of that and not the police. The police cannot, I mean, how is that, you know, that's biased to begin with. So how can they investigate each other? So that would be one of my main concerns that they're not, you know, they need some sort of uh, third party accountability. Do you think the mayor's office or an investigator of the mayor's choosing would be an acceptable third party? Or where do you think a mayoral office should fit into this? Well, I think the mayor office should, should um, initiate that. I don't know that they should actually appoint somebody, but I do think that they should initiate it, maybe form a committee and the committee can decide who, who would be in charge of that. But I do think it's the mayor's responsibility. After all, it is his city and he does run the police force. I want to begin uh, with a discussion about issue 24. This is a charter amendment, proposed charter amendment, that would give the Community Police Commission more power, power at all, in disciplining and investigating officers. Uh, Mr. Bibb, this issue has drawn opposition from the police chief, mm -hmm. from the safety director. You support issue 24. Uh, if you're elected and if this issue passes, you will no doubt face resistance from the police force in implementing this. If you are elected mayor, how will you get the police department to go along with this idea? Well, uh, this is personal for me. Uh, my dad was a police officer, and I remember having very vivid conversations about how to interact with the police officer as a son of a cop. He would say, Justin, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. But in this city right now, we spent over $30 million over the last 10 years trying to settle police misconduct claims. And I believe issue 24 is a positive step in the right direction to make sure we have more community voices around the table. Trust between residents and the police is critical to ensure that every community is safe and secure. And all across this country, you see good examples of this. Camden, New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey as well. When you have more community voices around the table, you get better accountability and you build the right kind of culture to make sure that our officers can come, come up to work every day with a good culture of policing. We have to try something new. The current system is broken. Council President Kelly, my question for you is this. Currently, the safety director is one of the key decision makers in officer discipline. Last year, a report from the Consent Decree Monitor concluded that the previous safety director uh, went too easy on officers accused of misconduct, in the Monitor's opinion. You oppose issue 24. Uh, how will a Kelly administration ensure that officer misconduct is handled appropriately? Thank you, Nick. There's a lot of rhetoric. There's a lot of buzzwords. And a lot of viewers might not be sure about differences between the two candidates. This is a defining moment, both in terms of policy and how each candidate goes about decision making. Issue 24 would make our neighborhoods less safe. Issue 24 would, re would result in hundreds of officers leaving the job. Issue 24 would result in slower response times. We need to look at what we have in place, which is the consent decree. If you look at the number of use of force cases since the signing of the consent decree, the number of complaints against the police, if you look at, and, and the, the, the figure, this $30 million that, uh, that my opponent throws out, we need to be grounded in fact here. How many dollars have gone out since the consent decree? Those are things that go back to 1975 that we're paying out right now. The number of dollars paid since the consent decree is dra dropped dramatically. There are no significant decisions since that happened. And again, when you choose, when you get on board with amending the charter, this is serious business. This should not be taken lightly. This is a critical issue. We need to do better. We need to defeat issue 24. And we cannot show any naivete that because it uses buzzwords like reform or accountability, that it is therefore good. Mr. Kelly, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bibb, I'll give you 30 seconds to respond. I believe um, Angela Miller's family deserves justice. Craig Bickerstaff's family deserves justice. And justice delayed is justice denied. $30 million is a 
critical, critical number to think about, but it's the lives that have been lost due to police misconduct that we can't put a price on. And right now, as the Maryland candidate, I believe that democracy works. My opponent does not believe in democracy because he, once again, he wants to undermine the will of the people. Voters want to be heard on this issue, and I believe getting more voices around the table to create a better culture and better training protocols is a good step in the right direction to make sure our law enforcement have the tools they need to fight crime all across our city and restore trust, restore trust on day one. That is essential. Uh, Mr. Kelly, I'll give you 30 seconds, and we'll move on seconds. to the next so, question. So, you know, we can talk about the, the tragic ha events that have happened, but that doesn't make this okay. You can try to, you know, clout, you know, shroud any way you want, but again, $30 million has not been spent since the consent decree has been signed. It is naive to say that, that you think that you can uh, use a number settling cases from 1975 and make it relevant to today. And the, the fact that the argument Hey, that this, that my opponent is not going to win this argument is the fact that he has to go to democracy and these things. I'm not against democracy. I don't have the power to stop this. This is going to the ballot. It's on the ballot. It is a charter amendment. It's serious. We cannot be naive. This shows a naivete in terms of the approach to government. I do want to move on to the next question, but thank you both very much for this discussion. Our next question uh, will be coming from Lawrence Daniel Caswell. Lawrence. Thank you both for joining us today. Greatly appreciate it. There is currently no public accounting for homicides that are solved or not solved in the city of Cleveland. This is a big issue for families who often feel like the police do not recognize their loss and aren't trying to get information out there that could help get tips and solve cases. Other cities do make that information available, make information about homicides available to the public. Washington, D.C., for example, posts printable online flyers with information on each unsolved case. As mayor, Will you make information about solved and unsolved homicides available to the public? Why or why not? Uh, Council President Kelly, we'll begin with you. Thank you. Before getting to the heart of the question, I want to make sure that we all understand that our solve rate for homicides is unacceptable. And that's because we are, we are not able to retain recruit and retain the talent that we need. And that's why I have to be cautious of something like issue 24 that will drive more officers away from the job. This is serious business. We have to make sure that all of our homicide detective positions are filled immediately. Um, and as far as data in terms of what's available to the public, I've stated since the very beginning of this campaign, I support open data for every, for every government record. I think it's important that the public uh, has access to the records. Public. Public records are the public's property, and I believe that they have, an, they have access to them. But again, there can be nothing worse than losing a member of your family to violent crime. The only thing that could possibly make that worse is to have the division of police understaffed and under-resourced to solve that crime, to reach out to that family, to make sure that they, they're being felt that their tragedy is our tragedy. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibb. You know, I've talked to so many voters across this city who are frustrated that when they lose a family member due to a gun violence in the city, that they can't get their call returned, that they're still fighting for justice. We need urgent leadership on this issue. Under the last, over the last 16 years since the council president has uh, been at the helm in City Hall, we have nearly an 80% rate of not having filed these cases, right? And we can't afford more of the same. We need transparency. We need to have urgent leadership on this issue. And as mayor, I'm going to do a better job of making sure we beef up our homicide unit and work with other members of federal law enforcement to ensure we can solve these cases immediately. These families deserve the ju justice. Uh, thank I you think, very much, Mr. Bibb. Uh, Council President Kelly, do you have a yeah, rebuttal you want to I do. offer there? Again, Just 30 seconds. 30, I promise. Uh, when we, the goals of beefing up the homicide detectives. It's not that easy. You have to understand the dynamics, the challenges of, ha of, of hiring officers that we're facing today. It's not something you can just be for or against or you say, I'm going to do this. Recruiting and training and retaining officers is hard. We have to make sure that we are laser focused on building a strong, diverse uh, division of police. And I'm telling you, one way we can ensure that we won't do that is with issue 24. Uh, Mr. Bibb, any rebuttal you'd like to offer? Well, I, I would just. Uh with all due respect to the council president, um, people are waiting. Uh, you've been in charge for nearly 16 years and we ha haven't seen any real success around these issues. Issue 24 does a better job of ensuring we have better trust between police and residents and that is critical to making sure that every community feels safe and secure. 
All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bibb. No, uh, Mr. Kelly, sure. Give you some more seconds, then Absolutely. we'll move on to the next no, question. Appreciate. No, if you look at the time that I've been council president, um, since the consent decree is has been signed the numbers are the numbers the facts are the facts you can come up with different you know buzzwords or things to talk about but the fact is a i am the the head of the legislative body not the executive but even as such we have seen a decrease in the number of use of force cases complaints against the complete against the police. We have cleared the complaints in the Office of Professional Services. Uh, the judgments that have been paid, it is they're the highest one I believe is $175,000, not $30 million. Uh, Mr. Bibb, we'll give you a couple seconds and we'll move say, on. I would say, when's the last time you held a hearing to investigate how we address this issue? We have held multiple hearings. I, I'm, I don't know why you don't know this, okay. but uh, we have held multiple hearings. We meet with the monitor. We Ever since the signing of the consent decree, we have had numerous, I don't know the number off 80, hand. 80 percent of had, homicide cases have, have not well, been You talked solved. about hearings. Do you want to know about the hearings? I don't know why you don't know this, but Cleveland City Council has been holding hearings, uh, bringing the monitor to the table, bringing the monitoring team to the table, going over everything that's involved with this consent decree and what our progress is. Thank you both, gentlemen, very much. I want to move on to our next question here from Elizabeth McIntyre. Thank you both for being here today. Attracting and retaining jobs in mm -hmm. Cleveland involves a lot of factors, including how safe workers feel. How would you address Cleveland's crime rate, and what role would you see the city's business community playing in making Cleveland safer? Mr. Bibb, we'll start with you. Well, uh, number one, uh, I want to make sure we deploy more of our officers on the beat. Uh, right now, 50% of our cops are walking the beat. The other 50% are behind the desk. The allocation makes no sense to me. I want to have at least 70% walking the beat doing the hard work of community policing. Secondly, we have to pay our officers more. We're losing so many of our new uh, police academy graduates to Shaker, Middleburg Heights, Beechwood, et cetera, because we're not paying officers enough to stay on the job. And then thirdly, we need to ch change the culture of our police department. Officers want fairness. Uh, they want to have a culture where talent is promoted, not based on who you know inside the department. And I would gladly work with the business community to make sure we are changing the culture of our department and leveraging some best practices from the private sector in order to do that inside our department. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibb. Council President Kelly. Thank you. We are not going to be able to bring the talent back you know, to downtown or to any neighborhood until we get our arms around this problem. This is something that's got to be dealt with immediately. And we need to look at where, how are we recruiting? How are we training? How are we retaining officers? Because this issue of safety isn't just in, in the neighborhoods other than downtown, it's in every neighborhood. And certainly as much as it is meaningful and essential to, uh, to residents, it means the same thing to businesses. I've had conversations about with um, some utility providers that they don't they don't like to go in you know in certain neighborhoods at certain times and it's like working with the police we get them there. We have to make sure that everybody believes in the safety of the people of the city of Cleveland. I have advocated for a real community policing program with many stations, with foot patrols, with bike patrols, with a community relations committee between the residents and the command staff of each district to make sure that we have an active community service unit, which is an off radio unit that responds to quality of life issues. We need to work with DCA to make sure that they're working hand in glove with the police to make sure there's a there's a culture of safety everywhere in the city of Cleveland. There is not there's not 50% behind the desk. The, the only creative way to get there is if you put every person who's injured, every person, every sergeant, anybody who has some supervisory responsibility and said that they're sitting behind a desk, which isn't true. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bid. Do you have a response you'd like to offer? I would just say that the data points that we have more police per resident than many of our peer cities, Columbus, Indianapolis, Dayton, Toledo, yet they are, those officers aren't deployed effectively. I was in Ward 1 the other day in Lee Harvard. You have two zone cars patrolling one of the largest districts in this city per shift. That's not good enough. We got to do a better job of redeploying our existing forces to make sure we have visible patrols all across our community. We got to change the culture at the top. Uh, Mr. You. Kelly. Yeah, thank you. I'll just say that there is a there is a deployment plan and uh, Every ward believes, every neighborhood believes that there's only one car in their ward. There are not just two zone cars per shift 
in Ward 1. I would just encourage anybody who wants to fact check this, just look at the deployment schedule. Policing is complicated. Policing is difficult. We need to make sure that we are working with our division of police through our through community relations committees to bring that trust, to bring police and the community together. And we can do that. We've done that in the second district where I, where I live ever since I've been on council. We've been doing community policing before it was a term. And it's something that I believe works. I think it's something that we can do in every single police district. Thank you both very much. We're going to move on to our next topic with this simple question. How welcome do you feel in Cleveland? Mm. There are thousands of people who in some fashion feel the sting of being an outsider for any number of reasons. Their race, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion. Carmen Lane is one of those people. As Rick spoke to Carmen about inclusion and how a mayor might foster and promote that goal, Carmen said inclusion must be addressed in a broad way, not with slogans and one-time outreach events. This exchange came after Rick asked whether Carmen, an artist from Glenville who self-identified as being black, indigenous, and queer, felt welcome in Cleveland. Well, I brought with me, Rick, props. a prop. This is a 1982 study done by the Greater Cleveland Roundtable on race relations in the city. Um, the results of this study said the following thing that really got my attention. It said that, uh, there is substantial agreement across the community about the major challenges that Cleveland faces, creating jobs to boost the local economy, improving the quality of the public schools, reducing crime and improving the effectiveness, sensitivity of the police and providing affordable and adequate housing. And our community in 1982 perceived racial tension as the major contributor to the seriousness of these major Cleveland problems. And so I wanted to share that with our community, including those who want to steward it, because I think for someone like myself, I'm aware that dealing with these issues in flat ways that aren't sustainable keeps us in a pattern where these are the things that we name and people like me fall through the cracks of the intersections of those subjects. And our first question, asking our first question for this segment will be Lawrence Caswell. Thanks, Nick. Last week in his final State of the City address, Mayor Jackson said that in order to be a great city, Cleveland must grapple with the underlying core issues of institutionalized inequities, disparities, and racism. Cleveland is a majority black and brown city that has deep-seated segregation issues. So I'm curious, as you see it, what are the greatest barriers to inclusion and equity in Cleveland today? And what role can a mayor actually play in reducing or removing those barriers? Council President Kelly, we'll begin with you. Thank you. Inclusion has to be the, the, the hallmark, the trademark of our city. And we have to do more than just talk about it. And let me just describe a few things that I've done about it. We, when I was shortly on when I was a uh, council president, it was brought to my attention that we do not have, the city of Cleveland did not have a language access plan. And I set about working with our friends at Legal Aid and with the, with the administration on how do we craft a plan that has every, that, that welcomes every Clevelander into City Hall. And this may seem like a simple thing to do, and in some ways it was. Uh, translating the website was easy. Uh, transcribing forms, that was easy. Uh, the real challenge came is that when we trained every public facing employee in the different languages and the different cultures and how are we reaching out, how are we making sure that the services at 601 Lakeside are inclusive and, and reach everybody. More recently, we passed Racism's a Public Health Crisis Resolution, and that's not just a paper resolution. That's something that comes with, with, with action. That's something where there's a team working on the four pillars of Racism's a Public Health Crisis in terms of housing, environmental justice, uh, you know, education, all those, the, the, the pillars that, they, that go to it. We need to make sure that we're looking through this lens every time we make a decision as elected officials. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Kelly. You. We're at a minute here. Uh, Mr. Bibb, uh, your, your chance at this question. Well, I think for far too long in this city we've yet to truly acknowledge the frustrations and pain of being one of the most segregated cities in America uh, has gotten us to um, and, and as mayor I'm committed to doing just more than talking about it but I want to do something about it 
number one, I want to hire a chief racial equity officer in my administration that will analyze every policy decision we make under a racial equity lens, first and foremost. Secondly, the east side of the city, where a majority of our black population uh, currently lives, has been forgotten in many cases. And we should be using a large share of the money we get, we're getting from the American Rescue Plan to ensure that we can bring back Mount Pleasant, Buckeye, Lee Harvard, and other aspects of the southeast side because they deserve the same economic opportunity we're seeing in other parts of our city. We got to invest in bringing back those neighborhoods to ensure we can address these racial inequities moving forward as a city. Thank you both very much. For our next question, we'll go to Elizabeth McIntyre. Well, the numbers don't lie. It's clear that we need more workers in our region. The data show we're not retaining the people already here. And let's face it, the demographics are not exactly working in our favor. That means we need to attract more people to live and work in Northeast Ohio, whether they are refugees, international students, or others who aren't homegrown. What will you and your administration do to be inclusive in the battle against brain drain and to ensure we have a more robust and diverse workforce? Mr. Bibb, we'll begin with you. Well, one thing that we have to do a better job of is really investing in the talent we get from our local universities. Uh, Pittsburgh has done a great job of this, of working with Carnegie Mellon and the city of per Pittsburgh to really leverage that talent that's there. You see that being done pretty well in Columbus as well. Um, as mayor, I would convene every college president in this city to identify how do we keep that talent in Northeast Ohio once they graduate from college or graduate school here in the city of Cleveland. Uh, secondly, we have to make sure that we are embracing that generation of talent inside City Hall. Uh, that's why I want to have a fellowship program in my administration that recruits the next generation of civil servants working in my, our administration because that's also a good way to make sure we have the right culture to invest in the next generation of talent right here in our community. Thank you very much, Council President Kelly. Thank you very much. We need to take a look at this from a short-term uh, lens and a long-term lens. The short-term lens is we need to do a better job reaching out and accepting our refugee and our, and our immigrant populations. That's something we can really begin working on day one. The Refugee Response Program has shown tremendous results. Uh, the work of Global Cleveland, uh, we can work with them to make sure that we are becoming a more welcoming city to immigrants. But in terms of retaining talent, people are going to go where jobs are. People are going to go where there's opportunity. And we need to look at what's stifling our opportunity. To me, the, one, the number one thing that is stifling our opportunity is that it's not that we don't have jobs, it's that there are thousands of open, available, high-paying jobs, but we are not properly training and skilling and educating our citizens, our own citizens for these jobs. And it doesn't start at the college level. It doesn't start working with, with university presidents. It starts with working with Eric Gordon, CMSD, and every, every grade school. Mr. Kelly, thank you very much. Getting the fifth and sixth grade to educate our kids and give them hope. Thank you. Uh, and we will be returning to economic development later on in the discussion as well. Um, our next question comes from Lawrence Caswell. In 2020, and a 2020 op-ed, Eliana Turan of the LGBT Community Center of Greater Cleveland said that Cleveland is the epicenter of the trans murder crisis, citing the violent deaths of eight trans women in as many years. After the murder of yet another trans woman this past June, it was reported by the Buckeye Flame and others that the victim was frequently misgendered by police and other city officials. As mayor, how do you intend to ensure that trans individuals feel not only safe in this city, but also feel seen and respected by city officials and employees? Uh, Mr. Kelly, we'll begin with you. Thank you. What you described is tragic and it's something that we cannot accept in Cleveland, Ohio with one of our fellow citizens. We need to make sure that everybody feels heard, respected, especially by members of the Division of Police. Um, there was a murder in Ward 13 that I'm very well aware of, and I, I, I think about it frequently. But we really, if you look at what can we do to move forward, we, we have to look at the steps that we have taken. Getting our municipal equality index to 100% was not, was not a, an easy term, an easy thing to do. Uh, when we've set forth, we had four ordinances um, when I was council president that we needed to get passed uh, to really get to that, that level. And the last one was a human rights, it was a anti-discrimination bill, which unfortunately got termed the bathroom bill. Well, that was mine 
to shepherd through counsel. That was something I needed to do to work through all of the different uh, challenges that that brought, and we did, and that was the fourth. That came after domestic Thank you very partnership much, Mr. registry, Kelly. benefits for same-sex couples, and this was kind of the crowning achievement. Uh, Mr. Bibb, uh, it's your turn. You know, this should outrage us all in this community. Um, and as mayor, I believe we can do a couple things. Number one, more investments in safe spaces for our LGBT population to live and thrive and feel like they're a part of our community. You know, I spent uh, some time at the LGBT Center in Detroit Shroway, and I was amazed at the programming they had uh, for uh, members of our community to go and feel like they have a place to call home. And as mayor, we should be prioritizing all across the city more safe spaces like that. Secondly, our police department must have the right training and protocols in place to be aware of these issues and also have the relationships in the community to better support our LGBT population. This is an outrage and we have to make sure we're aware and have the right training in place inside our department to address this issue long term. Uh, we'll have one more question on this segment uh, coming from Lawrence. Great. Thank you. Thank you. By the latest census, Cleveland's Hispanic and Latinx population stands at 13.1%. That's an increased increase of 23% from 2010, according to an analysis by Richie Paparin at Cleveland State University. What are your plans for adapting city services and public information to accommodate the fastest growing and, and likely the, the only growing demographic group in the city? Mr. Bibb, we'll start with you. Well. Um, Again, we, we have to do a better job of making sure that our Latinx population has a voice inside City Hall. Uh, if elected mayor, I intend to make sure that I have several members of the Latinx population in my cabinet. We also need to do a better job of investing in uh, Latinx businesses across our city. They deserve to have their fair shot in participating in economic opportunities across our community. And then in public education, we need to make sure that our Latinx students have good quality education, good quality after school programs like you see in Esperanza. That's how we make sure this is a safe place for our Latinx population to grow and thrive long term in the city of Cleveland. Thank you very much. Council President Kelly. Uh, thank you, and I'm proud to represent Ward 13, which is the highest growing Latinx uh, ward in the city of Cleveland. And that's, uh, it's, I think that's important to move forward to like really understand um, how you know, people's cultures and how people think and what they need. The first step that we did was, of course, the language access plan. Uh, the fact that when I became council president, City Hall was English only is not okay. Now we have eight languages, of course, including Spanish, because that is also, in addition to our, the fastest growing de uh, demographic, it's also the most frequently spoke uh, language outside of English. So we took that step. On my campaign, I have a Latinx outreach coordinator. We, are go we spend a lot of times at, at Hispanic events, at Latinx events, making sure that we're listening to the community, making sure we listen what their needs are. Further, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we, uh, we just passed two weeks ago, we passed the funding uh, for the projects that are happening on West 25th Street uh, for the Clark Fulton area where there's a large Hispanic population. There's no city in the, in the city, excuse me, there's no city that I'm aware of where with such a rich Hispanic population that there is not a neighborhood attraction, some sort of Hispanic village, some kind of congregating place. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. We'll now move on to our next topic, which concerns economic development. And that can mean anything from attracting large industries to retaining the workforce of the future to helping locally owned small businesses thrive. The candidates have had much to say on this topic, and so do Nidvia and Papo Ruiz, who own and operate the Rincon Criollo restaurant on Detroit Avenue in the Gordon Square Arts District and a new location on Denison Avenue. They have lost 70% of their business in the pandemic and hope for more support from a new administration. Uh, Envia Ruiz said responsiveness is key. Uh, we need help with the mayor with permits. Um, we're trying now to obtain our uh, liquor license. We're here for the second location on Denison. Um, MedZone was the one who encouraged us um, to get the first license and the first liquor license for the one in Detroit, the location in Detroit. And we have, and it's been very good. We've had a lot of success with that. And now we're trying to obtain it from the second location trying to um, have, uh, find somebody on the phone or trying to go in the building and locating someone who could help, who could give us some access, some enlightenment on, on what to do, what not to do, how to go about it, uh, paperwork, uh, who to talk to, phone numbers. Uh, that has really been a really challenge for us. 
and just getting there and, and have somebody help us. Elizabeth McIntyre of Cranes Cleveland Business has our first question on this topic. So what incentive opportunities do you envis envision for new businesses, but also to retain businesses already here? And will return on investment for the project, that is what other economic opportunities will be generated by the development project, be a factor, and how so? Council President Kelly. Thank you. So if, you, if we take a step back and look at who was hurt the most during COVID, it's the people that were struggling the most before COVID. Now, small business owners, for some reason, there's a misnomer that they are somehow wealthier, they are somehow, uh, you know, that they have it good. Well, small business owners are dreamers. They are people that max out their own credit cards, they take loans from their family and friends, and there is just nothing that, that, that burns me more that they're, when they're waiting for a sign off on their electrical permit or something so that they can realize their dream. So moving forward, we need a mayor who understands their pain that will make sure that we are investing in those businesses that were hurt most by COVID. And again, it, you don't have to look far. The number of restaurants that, that went out of business, the number of restaurants that can't find workforce right now, we have to make sure that we that we shore up this, this, this base of the economy because vital neighborhoods depend on restaurants, small businesses, and street level retail. There's an opportunity to direct ARPA dollars to, the, to these businesses, but we just have to value, we have to realize the value of these businesses. Thank you very okay. much. Mr. Bibb. It's my job as mayor to create the right conditions for good quality job creation all across the city. And right now in the city of Cleveland, we are operating in a 19th century world uh, in a 21st century economy. It's broken. As mayor, number one, I want to be able to fast track the permitting process so City Hall is moving at the speed of business. You should be able to have a digitized permit so you can track your permit over time. And it's a shame that during this pandemic, many small business owners applied for relief from this city, and it took months after months after months to get them the grants they needed to stay afloat. One month is too late in terms of keeping your business alive. So we need to do a better job of having a modern and responsive city hall that moves at the speed of business to ensure that we can create good quality jobs all across the city because small businesses are the backbone of our economy. And then thank you. And, uh, uh, Mr. Kelly, we'll give you 30 seconds to rebut. Yeah, thank you. When COVID hit and the people were waiting, small businesses were waiting for their PPP checks, the city of Cleveland stepped up with a, with a fund to bridge this gap. It didn't take months and months, but it, it took a minute. Now, the thing that we need to pay attention to, though, is it exposed something else, is that our small businesses need technical support and back office support because, you know, they didn't have three years of audited financial of payroll reports. So we need to make sure that we're, when, we, when we claw our way out of COVID, that we're giving our businesses the tools they need to succeed, and Thank City Hall much. will do that. Uh, Mr. Bibb, give you some time. Nope, you're all right. Well, thank you very much. Um, our next question goes to Lawrence Caswell. Thanks, Nick. You have both indicated that you are for allocating money in the city budget to support arts and culture, as well as establishing a cabinet level position to support arts in the city. Tell me what support for arts and culture would look like under your administration, in particular support for individual artists as opposed to arts institutions. Mr. Bibb. Well, one thing I get excited about is having an artist in residence in my administration that can work with my cabinet and commissioners to really think about how do we do a better job of designing basic city services, leveraging the creative energy of our artists uh, across our city. The other thing we gotta do a better job of in Cleveland is investing in great quality public spaces and our artists can truly play a large role in doing that all across our city. And then thirdly, you know, we need to do a better job uh, of investing in artists early on. You know, I was at a high school a couple weeks ago uh, at CMSD, and many of our students have been locked out of great art programs in this city. We got to start young because the artist economy is a main, a major driver in making sure we can have a globally competitive city long term. Mr. Kelly. Thank you. First thing we need to do is look at and make sure that we continue 
the public arts requirement of all public projects that they do have a public arts component. That has been a, a, a that's been a tr tremendous success. But now we need to move to make sure that, in terms of this economy, to make sure that we are giving artists an opportunity to succeed. There's there is no need for any artist to move out of the city of Cleveland. I had signed a, a contract to make to bring public art to our to our council chambers, and a critical component of it was that the that it would have a rotating. Uh, you know, artist stream, and they would be paid for their work, and it would be something where we would encourage artists to come to, to City Hall and talk about their work and talk about what they've done. But it's a step towards making sure that this part of our economy is included in Cleveland's recovery, make sure it's a part of City Hall, and really just beautify City Hall and make it, make it the gallery that it should be. It's a beautiful piece of architecture. It's a beautiful interior, beautiful rotunda. We can take it to the next level, but everybody needs to be paid fairly. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Uh, our next question concerns a major part of the economic picture, and that's education. We all know that the schools have been uniquely disrupted by the pandemic. Uh, for each of you, how can the Cleveland Metropolitan School District make up for pandemic learning loss and get students who have fallen behind back on track? Mr. Kelly, we'll begin with you. Uh, thank you very much. This, uh, this question means an awful lot to me. I am a CMSD dad. And I saw firsthand what happened when COVID hit and when students were sent home. I saw the fabulous job that our teachers did to do workarounds to make sure that they went from subject matter experts to technology experts and making sure that they were teaching kids, how do we use these devices? How do you upload your assignments? But we really need to acknowledge that we lost a lot during COVID. And the first thing we need to do is really assess. We need to have an individual assessment of every student and really make that determination because I don't know if we know just yet what we've lost because we're, you know, there's still, um, we're still in this reopening phase. We need to make sure that we do that. We need to make sure that we are understanding what was lost during COVID and what we need to move forward because we cannot afford in this community to have lost a year of education. It is just too important. I see it with my, in my, with my daughter's class and, and with her peers. There is some loss, and we have to bring, we have to get to where we were and then exceed where we were. Thank you. Mr. Bibb. You know, the achievement gap was a major issue before the pandemic, and in many cases, the pandemic um, accelerated that achievement gap and learning loss in our city. Now, have we made great strides in CMSD? Absolutely. Uh, I believe the Cleveland plan was a good step in the right direction. I'm excited to engage in the redesign of that plan if elected mayor. But as we think about the future of public education, it's important to tie this to the future of work. Um, to help our children in this moment, number one, we need to better invest in our teachers so they have the supports they need to keep our kids engaged in the classroom. We need more supports around high dosage mentoring for our students that have suffered a lot of learning loss during this pandemic. And I also believe we need to do a better job in this city of investing in high quality after school programs for our children. When I was growing up, when those street lights came on, I was either in the Boys and Girls Club or in the library doing something. Every neighborhood deserves high quality out of school time programming. That's how we meet the whole needs of our children. Uh, Mr. Kelly, did you have a rebuttal you wanted to offer? No, just really, as we, as we move forward, we have to really look at the education of the future. We have to stop thinking that we can not be talking about say yes and not talking about the portfolio of opportunities as motivation for the kids for the parents to understand that if they treat their academic you know life seriously if you if the parents work with the teachers and we as a community move forward there's a whole portfolio of opportunity waiting for our scholars we just have to do a better job of educating them on that promoting say yes to education and promoting all the jobs thank that you very them. much uh, mr bibb your time if you'd like it yeah i would just say um one of the things I've been recognizing as I've been canvassing and crisscrossing this whole city is that many of our parents don't feel like they have a voice in terms of what's happening in public education. Uh, we should be exploring having a robust parent, parent advisory board to advise our board of education and the CEO of CMSD and my administration, if elected mayor. Uh, I also wanna have a youth council in my administration where youth are at the center of how we improve not only public education, but how do we make Cleveland a great city that works for our children? Because if this city works for our children, it can work for everybody. Thank long you term. very much, Mr. Bibb. Before we move on to the next topic, let me remind our audience that you are tuned into Cleveland Mayoral Debate Voters First, a presentation of IdeaStream Public Media and the City Club of Cleveland. 
a nonpartisan nonprofit organization and one of the oldest free speech forums in the United States. Our partners for this debate include Crane's Cleveland Business and the Cleveland Documenters. We turn our attention now to the intersection of health and poverty and the disparity in health outcomes between richer, whiter zip codes and poorer, browner ones. One of the biggest health concerns for those poor neighborhoods is lead poisoning of children. Rick Jackson spoke with the Reverend Derek Wade, who lost his son Demetrius to lead poisoning. Demetrius was diagnosed at 12 in 1992 and died at 24. Reverend Wade says the city isn't doing enough to keep people safe, but that doesn't mean that he's lost hope. And I believe that we have made more progress in the last three or four years than, than at any time in the last 30 years. So um, it's, it's um, you, you, you don't want to get frustrated. You just keep raising the awareness for the public and for the parents and the children. And eventually um, it'll resonate with them how serious and how urgent the lead issue is. Although we don't know which of these two gentlemen it is yet, one of them that you're speaking to right now is going to be our mayor. Is this one of his first issues that you want him to tackle? Yes, it is. Most definitely. Uh, Cleveland is one of the worst lead contaminated cities in the United States. Um, recently, they talk about and bring up the water crisis and the lead crisis in Flint. And we know that it is uh, three times more uh, damaging here because of the, the housing stock that has been um, built before 1990, uh, 1978. The city recently began to implement the lead safe housing law that was passed in recent years, but there is a lot more work left to do. For our candidates, what can the city do to speed up the process of ensuring that our rentals are safe from lead paint and to make sure that landlords comply with the rules? Mr. Bibb, we'll begin with you. You know, I had the great fortune to meet Derek Wade on Saturday and his story just broke my heart. And it's a shame that it took a, a citizen-led effort to finally get action on this issue in the city of Cleveland. As Yvonne Hall has said, uh, the lead paint crisis in our city is public enemy uh, number one, and we need more urgent leadership on this issue now more than ever. Uh, that's why, if elected mayor, I intend to make sure we beef up our code enforcement within our building and housing department to make sure we can beef up enforcement and abate these homes that have been uh, plagued with lead paint. I also intend to appoint a lead czar at my administration to work across all of our departments to ensure we can eradicate this issue long term. And then as mayor, I would use a portion of the American Rescue Plan dollars as Councilman McCormick and Spencer have advocated for to make sure we can fully fund an endowment to eradicate this crisis in Cleveland once and for all. Thank you, Council President Kelly. Thank you. The lead crisis in the city of Cleveland is, is, is tragic, it's unacceptable, and we need to create a lead safe Cleveland. Um, the challenges that, that we have to deal with, with the work through, is really one of workforce. The number of, of certified lead inspectors in the city of Cleveland, we need to do a better job training, getting people ready. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the, the personnel within City Hall to, uh, to to really do it, you, you can't just beef something up because the requirements to be a building inspector aren't that, it's, it's not a resume position, there's other qualifications that you need to have and it's hard to find those people. So we're, we're, we're slowed down by workforce a little bit. But again, we can't use any of those excuses. We have to make sure that creating a lead safe Cleveland is priority number one. Yes, we were slowed down by COVID because the inspectors couldn't go in the houses during this time, but we have to get back on. We have, we have improved the rental registration and we just cannot rest until we have a true lead safe Cleveland. Thank you very much. Mr. Bibb, rebuttal you wanted to offer? Yeah, I would just say um, this is a part of politics in Cleveland that frustrates me and why I believe our campaign um, has resonated with folks all across our city. We can't be afraid to try hard things. There's always an excuse. Oh, this is this hard, it's hard to hire, and so we just give up. People want change. We've had 16 years of the failed status quo, and on this issue, we need urgent leadership to try hard things. Mr. Kelly? Thank you. It's easy to 
be for things. It's, it's easy to be against. And nobody's saying because it's hard, we're not going to do it. Getting the rental registration up to a point where it was workable was not easy. It was hard, and we did it. Uh, making sure that we have you know enough staff to get into houses it was hard it took a long time but we did it uh, you know what's frustrating about politics should be that it's too easy to say something on a campaign trail without delivering without a plan to actually deliver it there is nothing that I will say during this campaign that I don't intend to do as mayor or can do but again we have Thank to you move very much. away from words and look at actions our next question comes from Lawrence Cleveland's Department of Public Health has struggled for years with leadership turnover, loss of grant dollars, workplace discrimination, and difficulty dealing with pressing public health issues like lead poisoning, as, as we've been discussing. How would your administration run this department differently? Council President Kelly. Thank you. So the Department of Health is something that is a critical, this is, Public health is one of those just fundamental bread and butter municipal issues that has been part of city government for as long as there has been city government. We really need to look at the crisis that we have in front of us right now is COVID. We need to make sure the health department's first priority is going to be getting all of our citizens vaccinated and it's going to be done doing, doing so with a hyper local perspective in terms of making sure that we're reaching out to where people are in churches and libraries and rec centers and making sure that gets done. We also need to continue to work with, uh, with the state of Ohio. We need to, all those grant funders that deal with division of air quality. Our air quality right now is, is something that we need to begin work on right away. And that gets to our tree canopy. We need to make sure that the, that the tree canopy is part of our air quality plan. The, but the Department of Health just has to, it's got to start at the top. There's got to be leadership that's going to make sure that we are have public health as our as our first focus. Thank you, Mr. Bibb. Well, this pandemic truly exposed how inept we've been managing uh, our public health department year after year after year. Uh, right now, the public health department receives less than two percent of the entire city's budget, um, and even during this pandemic, we didn't have one epidemiologist employed in our department, and all across the city. Even internal city hall employees didn't even know how to get their shot and get vaccinated. And we need not only urgent leadership on this issue, but a mayor that's willing to think outside the box. Um, I intend to explore uh, a partnership with our county public health department to make sure that we can fully support public health in our city. Better partnerships with UH, Cleveland Clinic, and Metro Health to not only address some of the disparities we see in our community, but from a public health policy perspective, where should Cleveland be going in the future? Now is the time for action on this issue. We cannot afford more of the same. Thank you, and uh, Council President Kelly, would you like to respond? Just that the, the Department of Health is a critical function for the city of Cleveland. And um, um, my opponent has thought, thrown this 2% thing out on more times than, than I can remember. But it's just not true unless you don't take into consideration all of the dollars that come, for example, the state of Ohio, we're their agent for the Ohio EPA in terms of air quality. There's a whole lot more money that comes in than just what is transferred from the general fund. Mr. Bibb, would you like to respond? I'm good. All right, we'll move on to our next question from Elizabeth McIntyre. Thank you, Nick. Um, the neighborhoods around our major healthcare systems are suffering from decades of disinvestment, poverty, and poor health. What will your administration do to improve population health in Cleveland and to lift the fortunes of people who live not only in the shadows of, this, of these anchor institutions, but beyond them? Mr. Bibb. You know, this issue um, is important. You know, we tout the fact that we are a healthcare mecca across this country, but in Huff, in Central, on Cedar, uh, many of our residents have some of the worst health disparities that will rival, in many cases, uh, third world countries. As mayor, I'm gonna take this issue head on. We gotta do a better job of making sure that residents in these neighborhoods have access to jobs in these institutions, but also that they have good access to quality health care services in this community. And we need to do a better job of examining these charity care investment dollars to ensure we're actually seeing real investment in these neighborhoods. And it's going to take a mayor that can truly bring these institutions together to get more accountability on this issue long term, I believe. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. Indeed, we cannot be the healthcare capital of the world if the neighborhoods surrounding these great institutions 
are in poverty. Uh, that's why I'm happy to have worked with my colleague, Bashir Jones, to make sure in just the four years that we've been working together that over $500 million has been invested in Huff for development and in parks and in, in public improvements. Uh, working with my colleague, Kevin Conwell, to make sure the projects like the Glen Village Project uh, project come to fruition. It's showing people that investment works in all our neighborhoods, which is going to be critical for the next mayor. But we also have to have a different approach to public health, uh, just like we do in Old Brooklyn. We need to start with a neighborhood health assessment, and we need to start doing a better assessment over not who has access to health care or doctors or when your doctor's appointment. We need to start asking questions like, do you live within a 10-minute walk of a park? Do you have access to fresh food? Do you feel safe in your home? Do you have a job? Do you know your neighbors to the left and the right? Is there a school in your neighborhood that you can send your kids to. That's how we really get to neighborhood health equity and quality health in our neighborhoods. Thank you very much. I want to move to one more question on this topic, and that is COVID-19 vaccinations. According to the Cleveland Department of Public Health, at last check, just shy of 40 percent of Cleveland residents are fully vaccinated against COVID-19. What should the city be doing to get more people vaccinated and protected from the virus right now? Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you. Right now, today, we need to make sure that we are getting to where the people are. We need to make sure we are vaccinating people in churches, in libraries, in, in rec centers. We have to set up, you know, we set up the Wolstein Center, which was in many ways very well executed and people had a good experience, but people just weren't going down to the Wolstein Center to get their shot. I was, uh, I was knocking on doors and I ran into an elderly, I, an elderly woman answer the door and she told me she hasn't gotten her shot yet because she was waiting for somebody to come and tell her, you know, how to get and where to go. That can't be our approach. We have to make sure that we are reaching out. Vaccination is the one thing, it's the one, the one weapon we have against this that we know works and improves public health. We have to make sure that vaccinations and vaccines are available to people where they are. Our health department needs to be a partner in that, but that's gotta be something that we should start tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Bibb. We got to go on the offensive on this issue. Uh, the mayor's office matters when it comes to raising public awareness about why it's important to get vaccinated. You talked about the 40% vaccination number. That's even worse in communities of color all across the city. As mayor, I would be knocking on doors myself talking about why we should trust the science, talking about the importance of getting vaccinated because we can't get our economy moving again until everybody in the city gets vaccinated and that we're back to safety all across our city. The mayor's office should matter when it comes to this. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to our next topic, and that is infrastructure. Infrastructure, uh, right now, uh, federal money is expected from the American Rescue Plan Act, and in fact, half of it is already here. Possibly another infusion of funds could come if Congress hammers out an infrastructure deal. Infrastructure spending will be a key issue for Cleveland's next mayor. Clevelander Diana Hildebrand spends a lot of time biking around Cleveland. She wants smooth and safe roads and sidewalks for everyone, motorists, bicyclists, and pedestrians to share. She told us the next mayor needs to address what she sees as a big east side, west side disparity in infrastructure investment. What we need from our next mayor is to look at the differences between the east and the west side of Cleveland and how we can make them connected and very similar in a lot of ways and safer. Our infrastructure on the east side is definitely lacking when it comes to how the roadways are constructed, safety on our roadways, our sidewalks. How do you, how can you connect your, your streets to the sidewalk in a safe way? Most of our sidewalks on the east side is curbs. <laughs> There's no ramp to get on. Um, and what, I'm want, what I really want to see is to connect us, to make us cohesive, to make us a real community. With the, all the disconnections between our roadways and infrastructure, it lacks community. And I believe that if we connect those, we'll bring more people into different types of neighborhoods where they can explore and see the beauty what, of what Cleveland can really offer. And our first question goes to Elizabeth. Well, Nick, you mentioned the American Rescue Plan, so let's start there. Um, this has the chance to have a lasting positive impact on a lot of Clevelanders' lives. So how do you plan to use the American Rescue Plan funds and potentially the infrastructure resources? 
Mr. Bibb, we'll start with you. Well, uh, when I got word of the fact that we were going to have uh, over a half a billion dollars through the American Rescue Plan, I called for establishing an Office of Economic Recovery that will work with the Chamber, Jumpstart, Team NEO, and our other CDCs to make sure we have a cohesive strategy around how we spend these dollars. Secondly, we should be leveraging this capital long term to invest in our neighborhoods, to identify shovel ready projects all across our community, and then finally, finally make sure we can use these dollars to eradicate the digital divide and once and for all fund a lead paint endowment to ensure we have no more lead paint across this city. I would also say this, all across this country, mayors have worked with their council leadership to have a plan. We are still waiting on real action right now in this city. And we need a mayor who can work with the next council president to ensure we get real action on this issue immediately come day one. Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you very much. It's gonna be tough to answer in 60 seconds, but here's, here's my best shot. We have food insecurity. Uh, we have housing insecurity. We need to deal with, the, with housing, both demolition, blight removal, lead. We need to deal with our broadband access. We need to deal with um, the, um, the food bank, the food insecurity, making sure that we are contributing to the food bank, hunger network, those people that have ex really expressed a pain. We can put it in our parks, public works. There is a, this is transformational, generational, this is once in a lifetime. And that's why thus far we have taken steps. We have already funded uh, the food bank's capital. We put money towards broadband already. We didn't have to, we know that the need is there. We know that there's a plan being worked on. And again, we're not waiting for anything. We're working on a plan. We had a committee hearing today. We've I've, we've been working on this since March 11th in terms of putting together the categories of buckets and how are we best going to distribute this. Broadband was crisis now. Like we said, when broadband happened, my daughter and CMSD sent home 38,000 scholars knowing that 18,000 of them Kelly. did not have broadband access. Thank you very much. Mr. Bibb, was there a response you wanted to offer? No? All right, we'll move on to the next question. The newly renamed Cleveland Guardians, the city of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, and the state of Ohio are proposing a $435 million 15-year lease extension deal. It would cost the public sector $285 million over the life of that deal before factoring an additional cost tied to a 10-year renewal after that. Do you believe that this is a good deal for the city, Mr. Kelly? Uh, thank you. We cannot lose the Guardians as a, as a part of the Cleveland fabric. Uh, we, we, cannot, we cannot risk that. But we need to make sure that we come up with a plan that is fair, that is fair to the public, that is fair to the team. And the, the plan that is in front of us has started the, the very beginning of the council deliberation project. So I still have a lot of questions about it, but, the, but I am familiar with the parameters. I've read the term sheet. But again, we just have to make everything is a but-for question. By spending this, by allowing the the uh, admission tax to be used in such a way, does that do we get the economic benefit from this this stadium, this this uh, th this arena? Now, the throughout the years, this arrangement has been very good to the city. But we need to make sure as we move forward that in keeping the team, we have a trust, a bond with the public that they understand that that we are we are going to spend what is needed to keep this team and to keep this an economically robust part of Cleveland's economy. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibb. Is this a good deal for the city? Well, listen, um, that's to be debated. Uh, I would say a couple things. Number one, the fact that we have three major league sports teams in the city of Cleveland is a major economic and civic asset. Don't get me wrong on this. However, there is deep frustration and anger and pain in the fact that the public and even city council is the last to know when these deals get done. And that's why folks are still upset about the fact that they didn't have a vote on the Quicken Loans deal. And for us to truly put people and neighborhoods first, we gotta make sure we have strong public input and public engagement, not when the deal is done, but when the deals are created in the first place. I would also say this, I would wanna see stronger community benefits agreements and metrics and goals around all of these plans to make sure that our neighborhoods are getting their fair share of resources long-term. Mr. Kelly, was there a response you wanted to offer? Uh, yes, 
This deal was not negotiated uh, with, without counsel. It is in front of counsel. We are discussing it now. Nothing happens without counsel being involved. And I don't know, I'm not sure what my, my, my opponent's been involved in one of these deals before to understand how they go. But generally speaking, you know, the, 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 the term sheet is given to Cleveland City Council, and then we, then we deliberate on it. That's when we bring public. That's when we bring the public in. That's when all this happens. He mentioned the Q deal. I'm not sure if he knows this, but the petition committee withdrew the petitions. I didn't. I don't have the authority to do that. The petition committee did it. Thank you very much. Mr. Bibb, any response? Again, um, the council president is distorting the truth. He worked with Republicans downstate to deny the will of the people on this issue. And he does not believe in democracy. Democracy works. And for far too long, we've had a city where we barely just got public comment for the first time in 100 years. Without resident voice and input, we're going to continue to see more frustration on these issues. We need a mayor who believes in the will of the people and taking real public input from day in and day out all the time. Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you. Um, this is a perfect example of not having a command of the basic facts, and it shows a naivete towards how government works. I would challenge anybody who's looking at this, re go back and look at what happened. The petition committee in the Q deal withdrew the petitions. It is not something that I could do. I didn't go to Columbus to do that. Uh, that is something that the petition committee did. This is, uh, you've got to have a better knowledge of facts if you want to run for the mayor of the city of Cleveland. And if you want to bring this up, if you're going to tax somebody with something, at least make sure your facts are kind of right. And this is something that is just absolutely wrong. Please check the facts. The petition committee withdrew the petitions. Mr. Kelly, Mr. Bibb, any response? The council president continues to deny the will of the people. He does not believe in resident voice. I know the facts, and I have the experience to lead on day one. Thank you but very again, much. Well, I'm well, sorry. Okay, but, talk a little bit more time. Sure. Sure. I mean, that I don't believe in democracy is just you're running out of thing, you're running out of charges against me. This is something where, again, people have a right to petition their government. They have a right, just like this issue 24 is going to the ballot. I can't stop that. The facts so are the facts. So why did you stop a vote on the minimum the wage? Facts, the facts are the facts. The petition committee and the minimum okay. wage withdrew the petitions. I don't have the authority to do that, and you should know that. If you're running for the mayor of the city of Cleveland, you should know how government works, at least a little bit. Uh, Mr. Bibb, will give you a chance well, to respond um, if you want, and then we'll move on. Senator Sheriff Brown believes I know how government works. Reverend Otis Moss believes I know how government works. And the plain dealer in Cranes Cleveland also believe on how our government works. The voters will decide come November 2nd. Thank you very much, both gentlemen. We'll now move on to our next question from Elizabeth McIntyre. Cleveland Hopkins International and Burke Lakefront Airports are both city and uh, owned and operated and facing their own challenges. Burke is losing more than a million dollars annually, and Hopkins. Um, earlier this year, city officials announced a $2 billion plan to remake the aging infrastructure at the airport. What do you see for the future of Hopkins and Burke? Uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth. This question will go first to Mr. Bitt. You know, I think it's past time we have an honest conversation about uh, the future of Burke. However, in the short term, I would prioritize better connecting downtown to our lakefront. Uh, excited about the proposed plan that we we're seeing from the Browns in order to do that as well. And then when it comes to Hopkins, as we think about this $2 billion master plan, we need to make sure it's tied to a focused strategy on how we're going to grow and attract and retain businesses. You have great work going on right now with the Arizona Alliance. The city, in many cases, has been absent in those conversations. And we can't afford to not have a mayor who's involved in these discussions, because until we have a competitive airport, we won't have a competitive economy long term. But I am willing to have an honest conversation about Burke. I know the issues, high construction costs, the US Army Corps of Engineers has a dredging facility there, and a potential fine from the FAA. These are all things we should discuss because the future of our lakefront is at risk here. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. Hopkins is the front door to Cleveland, Ohio for many of our visitors, and it's critical to business travel if we want to keep business and industry in Cleveland. A uh, conversation I had a few years ago uh, with 
a company that was speculated may, may move. They're like, of course we're going to stay in Cleveland as long as it makes sense, as long as there's dailies to the places where we have businesses. We need to make sure that we are creating that atmosphere where our legacy carriers want to be a part of Cleveland. We need to make sure they're expanding routes. And part of that is Burke Lakefront Airport. We need to make sure that we are being smart about Burke Lakefront Airport. It's not just the real estate. It's the idea that if that if Burke were to close and that traffic were to come to Hopkins, that would slow the takeoff, the landing, uh, the whole schedule of operations that we have at Hopkins. So it's not a simple issue. Any candidate that just says, I'm going to close Burke, I would just recommend cross, crossing yeah. them off of your list because it's a lot more complicated than that. But again, the, this is a regional economic asset that we have to preserve. Mr. Bibble, give you a chance to respond. Yeah, again, another distortion. I didn't say I'm going to close Burke immediately. What I said was... Now is the time to have an honest conversation about how we can work around these issues. And again, we have a county airport that we have with Cuyahoga County. We have Akron Airport, that's another regional airport. And we have an airport in Lorraine. So these are all things we can work around. But for far too long, we've talked about Burke and had no real action. We should have an honest conversation about the future of that asset. Mr. Kelly, you've got some time. Thank you. Well, we've had honest conversations. We've had more than conversations. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but we gave an option to a developer to look at to see if there is any feasible way that, that it could be developed. We have soil samples. We have borings. It's not something that we that it hasn't been discussed. It's that it's been discussed, but you know a lot of people don't like the answer. Um, the, the answer is that it's challenging. We need to really take a look at this asset. But again, we can we can have a more regional approach to our air service and where the uh, where the reliever airports are. But we have to make sure that we understand that Hopkins is the center of this of this um, aviation economy. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Kelly. This is Cleveland Mayoral Debate, Voters First, a presentation of IdeaStream Public Media and the City Club of Cleveland. Our partners for this debate include Crane's Cleveland Business and the Cleveland Documenters. And I invite you to listen to our podcast after Jackson, Cleveland's next mayor, which provides a weekly examination of candidate activities, voices from voters, and in-depth reporting on the issues facing Cleveland's next mayor. We started the podcast in July and post new episodes every Wednesday. You can listen on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, or NPR One. Just look for After Jackson, Cleveland's next mayor. Now on to our final round of questions, which will start with this question. How does a new mayor help make this city's government work better? One answer, better communication and engagement. Courtney Michelle Reese, who is 28, told Rick her generation is less involved than it could be and less aware than it could be. Courtney described the disconnect between City Hall and her generation of potential voters. She said many of her peers feel current leaders and candidates for office are ignoring them and not taking advantage of new methods of reaching out to younger voters. We are in the dark. We have no mm -hmm. idea. And if we keep going at this pace that we're going, then nothing's going to change, you know, because whatever we're doing right now, it's not working. Because, like I said, if I didn't have my mom, I wouldn't know what's going on. You know, I'm sure that mm -hmm. my friends don't know what's going on. You know, my college ex roommates don't know what's going on. And the question is, why don't these people know? You know, why is it so much the older generation? Like, how can we get the younger generation involved? Because eventually we're going to become that older generation. And if we're not already learning the things that we need to know, then it's just going to domino effect from there. Thank you very much. Our first question will go to Lawrence Daniel Caswell. Thanks, Nick. It is 2021, and right now I can pull out my phone and tell you how many Uber drivers there are within a half mile radius of here. I can find how-to instructions on writing debate questions, and I can translate this sentence into pretty much any language I want to. And yet, on the city's website, I cannot easily search for, say, all the rental properties registered within the city, or even find a full list of the city's boards and commissions and when they meet or what they'll discuss. What are your plans for updating not just the city's website, but public facing city communication systems in general to meet the 21st century standards that are commonplace in other sectors? This question will go first to Mr. Kelly. Thank you. Making sure that 601 Lakeside is seen as a partner, as a, as a, as a, 
is an entity that's going to help you get to where you need to be. That's that's got to be our goal. Whether you're going there for a birth certificate, whether you're going there for a permit, whether you're going through whatever brings you to City Hall, or if you're generally interested in government. That's why I believe the first step is to make sure that we have an open data model. Um, on Cleveland City Council, we began by we, we began um, hiring a social media consultant to start making sure that we were communicating, not just on our website, but on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, to make sure we're doing everything we can to reach people. Because we want people to feel a part of their government. It works better the more people that are involved. It works better when we are reaching out to people, that, that we are being transparent and we are including people to the extent that we can. And again, it's just, uh, it's, it's always a challenge to find out how do we reach out to people, but we've got to always be improving. We, we've got to get there so that every citizen of Cleveland feels a part of this great city. Thank you. Mr. Bibb? Well, um, this is personal for me. I'm a 34-year-old millennial running to be the next mayor of Cleveland. And our campaign, I think, embodies the future of this city and the future of this country. Young people stepping up. In our campaign, we engage nearly 100 students so far to knock on doors talking about the future of the city. And that's how I'm going to govern. I want to have a youth council in my administration to give us feedback on how we can be more better from a technology-facing perspective. When it comes to basic city services and operations, we should be able to track your call with the mayor's action line like you track a FedEx package or an Amazon package. You should be able to start a business in Cleveland on your smartphone like you can do in the city of Miami. When I was on the board of RTA, I led our technology and innovation committee where we live stream our board meetings. I led an effort to bring our first ever chief innovation officer. It's those kind of basic upgrades we need to make Cleveland relevant, not just in 2021, but in 2050. Thank you very much, Mr. Bibb. Mr. Kelly, did you have a response you wanted to offer there? No. Okay, thank you very much. On to our next question, voter turnout. Turnout in the primary uh, was about 16% in the city of Cleveland. If 25% of registered voters showed up this fall in the general election, it would be more than the turnout four years ago. What specifically have your campaigns done and what ought you do in the future uh, to make sure that we address this lack of voter engagement in our local elections? Mr. Bibb? Well, I talked about the example with uh, students for Bibb. The other thing I would say is our campaign did something very different. We were one of the first campaigns to announce on January 12th and at the height of this pandemic, we did the hard work of meeting voters where they are, hosting meet and greets on Zoom, taking uh, questions unfiltered from residents all across the city. I've been knocking on doors and doing meet and greets in backyards and front porches. And I believe that that work has to continue once I'm elected mayor, because that's how you do a better job of connecting residents to the daily workings of what's happening in city government day in and day out. I would also say this, the time that you have to come down to city hall to pay for parking or take two buses to see your mayor, that's outdated. We should be, we should be bringing, bringing government to the people like using our libraries as a front door to City Hall where residents can see and fill their city on a daily basis. Thank you, Mr. Bibb. Uh, Mr. Kelly, this question is next for you. Thank you. No candidate wants low voter turnout. Um, it's something as a candidate you do, you work to drive the, 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 uh, the vote out. And that happens through a, a number of ways that we shouldn't be doing just during campaigns. Um, you know, the, the door knocking, the, the, the meet and greets, all of the, the information that's sent through the mail, the social media, TV. We need to make sure that people have a sense that their vote matters, that they are included in this government. And, you know, we all have to also acknowledge that when people are in poverty, when people are struggling to work two, three jobs, put food on your table, make sure that your kids are clothed and, and ready for school the next day, sometimes voting's not as important to them. Uh, because they've got more stressors than other people in, in our community. So we really need to find a way to continue to make voting as easy as possible. That's why I have pushed against the, uh, the, the Secretary of State's um, Dropbox program. We have the most restrictive law in the state of Ohio that sadly the Supreme Court found to be permissible. But we have to just really look at those barriers of people voting and we have to break them down. We have to start at the state level. Thank you very much. The state does not want to encourage our residents to vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. For our next question on this topic, we'll turn back to Lawrence Daniel Caswell. Thanks, Nick. 
Since Cleveland Documenters began covering City Council last November, Documenters have noted several instances of council members expressing frustration with the current administration's delays in providing information or answering questions. Some council members have even suggested the administration sends legislation late, leaving council less time to consider it. What will you do to improve communication between council and the administration while still maintaining the checks and balances necessary for our system of government? Mr. Kelly, we'll start with you. Thank you. It's just part of a councilman's job to be frustrated with the administration from time to time. That's uh, There's a natural tension between the executive and the legislative branch, and I spend a lot of my time trying to, you know, trying to clear those roadblocks and, and, and get things done. In terms of legislation, though, we have a schedule. If it's not in by a certain time, it, it doesn't get heard. It's not as if things are getting jammed on the calendar Monday at 6 o'clock. But it is important that we, that the mayor has a strong working relationship with the council. I believe when I'm mayor, having been a councilman, having been a council president, I will understand those differences. I will understand those needs and where that tension comes from because I understand how important it is for a council person, if they have a project that they're waiting on, that it gets executed, that they are there for, they are being held responsible when the permit doesn't get issued. They are being held responsible when the goldenrod sheet doesn't get signed. We have to make sure that as mayor, I will have a very unique perspective of how council uh, needs the services of mayors. We'll have a very strong, aggressive working relationship thank you very on every much. issue. Mr. Kelly, thank you. Mr. Bibb. Well, I think I'm uniquely qualified to hit the reset button in terms of the current relationship between the mayor's office and uh, city council. As a member of city council, you shouldn't have to find out for nearly two years on Fox 8 News that we weren't recycling. As a member of city council, you shouldn't be last to know when, we, when we're looking at major legislation when it comes to stadium financing deals in the city. And if elected mayor, I intend to treat city council as a co-equal branch of government because they deserve that kind of transparency and respect for me and my administration. I also believe that now as you do the hard work of making sure we're meeting the basic needs of our residents. The mayor and their staff must be working with members of city council in the neighborhoods, attending their community meetings, having quarterly meetings with city council staff to look at these issues. We need to treat city council like a co-equal branch of government because they deserve that kind of transparency and accountability from this administration. Thank you, Mr. Bibb. Mr. Kelly, do you have a response? Yeah. Mayor of the city of Cleveland, I believe, when I get there, that is the hardest job in government. The second hardest is to be a councilman. It is hard work dealing with the, the, the neighborhood issues and you're really that front line, you're the face of their, you're the first ear that they have for their anger towards all things government. You're, you're the front door to, to, to government. So I will go in understanding just how important that communication is, just how important execution of, of these of these project is. We will respect each other and we will do great Thank things Thank you very together. much. Mr. Bibb, a response you'd like to offer? I would just say the lack of discontent with uh, this council leadership and the mayor's office on the American Rescue Plan is a prime example of them not knowing how to work together. We can't afford more of the same. And in this election, if we have more of the same, we're going to continue to see the same old, same old, same old. Enough is enough. Well, we and do want to say, move quickly to uh, closing statements, but we do have one more question from Elizabeth McIntyre. The problems at the West Side market are well documented. Some vendors at the market have suggested that the Cleveland Metro Parks or another nonprofit take over operations. What is your plan specifically to remedy the long-standing issues at the West Side Market? Mr. Bibb, we'll begin with you. Uh, I was just at the uh, West Side Market uh, last Saturday for breakfast talking to vendors and, you know, there's so much frustration at the lack of management, uh, the lack of responsiveness, and the lack of care of how we treat this amazing asset in our city. Like other public markets across the country, I support Councilman Kerry McCormick's recommendation to bring in an independent nonprofit operator to support the city in executing a plan and a vision for the market. And we also need to do a better job of making sure our vendors have a seat at the table with these discussions. We don't need another consultant. We have a pathway. We have a good proposal that Councilman McCormick has put together. And as mayor, I will support that proposal on day one. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. The West Side market is too important to fail. We need to make sure that we are we are tending to all the needs of the vendors and the building itself. But we have to stop uh, responding to the West Side Market on a case by case, problem by problem basis. 
we need to make sure we have a full assessment of the capital product and the vendor mix and what it's going to take to build a great market. Now, it is premature for me to pick a model that I like better than others because I've read them all. There is, there is value in all of them. Uh, I, the, just for example, the vendor model where we bring in a, a nonprofit vendor to manage it makes some sense to me because I know that we own the airport, but we don't do the, the concessions and we don't do the parking. But again, just making sure that the vendors feel that they're being listened to, making sure people understand that change is going to come on day one, that we are going to take a different approach to the market that isn't on a case-by-case -case basis or a problem-by-problem -problem basis. We're going to look at the entire asset and we're going to push this forward and we're going to build a great market. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Time now for closing remarks. A reminder that you will each have one minute and we will go in the same order as opening remarks. Mr. Kelly, we begin with you. Thank you very much and thanks for everybody who tuned in today, tonight. Uh, this is the most critical election of our lifetimes. We are coming off of two major recessions in 10 years. And now we're hearing of other things on the horizon, whether it's inflation, supply chain. We have a violent crime problem that is out of hand. We have an economy that we have never seen before. We need a mayor who is ready to be mayor on day one. And again, if you look at all the talk, if you look, you, know, you can have a choice. The choice couldn't be clear. You can have rhetoric or you can have results. We can have a, we can have, you know, platitudes or progress. But if you need a, a, an issue to really look at the difference between the candidates, it is issue 24. Issue 24 would make our neighborhoods less safe. It would make our, it would make recruiting and retaining police officers nearly impossible, and it would really decimate the division and make our neighborhoods less safe. It also shows a naivete to jump into Mr. something. Mr. Kelly, thank you very much. It's been a that minute. That would change the charter forever until another ballot initiative. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Bibb, your closing statement. This will be the most important election, I believe, in Cleveland's history. So I'm asking the voters one simple question. Who do you trust? Who do you trust to do the hard work of not only lowering crime and paying our officers more, but making sure that every resident feels safe and secure and gets the trust and respect they deserve with equal justice under the law? Who do you trust to bring in new ideas to have a more modern and response to City Hall to move our city into the 21st century? Who do you trust to do the hard work of making sure that every child has a quality education so they can live up to their God-given potential? I believe that now is the time for not just urgent leadership, but leadership that is willing to turn the page from the failed politics of the past, because we know where that's gotten us. The lowest population since the 1800s, the least connected city in America, worst city in this country, for black women, we can't afford more of the same. Join our movement because Cleveland can't wait. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much, Mr. Bibb. Thank you to both of our candidates, and thank you to our audience for listening as well. I'm Nick Castell. Good night. Cleveland mayoral debate, Voters First, is made possible by grants from Assembly for the Arts, the Cleveland Foundation, and the George Gunn Foundation. Antiques Roadshow is up next on WVIZ, Idea Stream Public Media. This is the most important election of our lifetimes. We cannot afford more of the same. Racial and economic justice is on the ballot. Who will be the next mayor of Cleveland? Will it be nonprofit executive Justin Bibb? We have an opportunity to elect bold, new, visionary leadership or City Council President Kevin Kelly. We need a serious candidate with a serious plan. To help inform voters, IdeaStream Public Media and the City Club of Cleveland will present Cleveland Mayoral Debate Voters First, Monday, October 11th at 7.30 p.m. Watch the debate on WVIZ or stream at ideastream.org. The largest Arctic expedition ever. We want to understand why the ice is melting. It impacts everything we do, all of the weather that we experience. There's never been